Uh, welcome to, to our first day of, of our Topological Matter Conference. Uh, today, we are going to shift a little bit of topics. Uh, yesterday, we were focusing on the real space uh, objects like skirmions and uh, also on topological insulators and uh, wet semi-metals. Uh, today, we're going to include uh, topological superconductivity, for example, and we will have a focus on topological bosonics with some uh, very beautiful talks on, on photons and topological photonics. Uh, we have two sessions. Uh, in the in the morning, uh, these sessions are uh, include three uh, talks, as you can see here in the in the program, and in the afternoon we have another three uh, talks. So, in order to interact uh, with the, with the speakers, you had to be uh, connected via Zoom in the links that were provided to those that are registered. Um, and, uh, and then you will see uh, these icons at the bottom of your screen. You have to, if you want to type your questions and don't forget it, you can type it anytime during the talk by clicking here on the Q&A icon, or you can raise your hand and, and then at the end of the talk, uh, you will be called upon by, uh, by our, uh, our chair uh, this morning, uh, Dalian Lancelotti Kimura. Uh, and then you will ask your questions either by, by speaking up or uh, someone will read it uh, for you if you wrote it here. Now, at the end of, of, the, of, the, of the session, of the, of the talks, and in particular at the end of these talks, you have coffee breaks in which you can have discussions with uh, Zoom uh, meetings here uh, with these two speakers and here with this uh, speaker. And the link uh, for the for these Zoom meetings will be given immediately before the break in the chat. So you go there and you click, and then you will have the opportunity to have an informal discussion and ask questions to uh, the previous speakers. Uh, so without uh, talking much more, and we'll give uh, uh, the, the word to uh, Daniel, and, and then he will introduce the speakers immediately afterwards. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Depending on the place of the world that you are sitting in front of your computer at this moment, welcome to this conference and to this morning session of the Topological Matter Conference. My name is Daniel Lancelotti Kimura. I am a researcher, CNRS researcher at the Center of Nanoscience and Nanotechnology in Palais of France, and it's my great pleasure to chair this session. The first speaker is Alberto Amo. Alberto Amo is a researcher at the Laboratory of Physics of Lasers, Atoms, and Molecules, and his talk is going to be about artificial magnetism for photons in polariton lattices. He will show us two intriguing ways of st and strategies to implement artificial magnetic fields. Alberto, you can share your screen and unmute your microphone. Okay. Um, I cannot share my screen. Sorry. Adriana, maybe you can help us. Now I can. Perfect. Thank you very much. So here we are. OK. So OK. We, we so, can see your screen. Very well. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Daniel, for the introduction. And thank you very much for the organizers, to the organizers, for giving me the opportunity to present uh, our recent work. So compared to the, 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 the day of yesterday, we are going to shift gears quite a bit because we now we are going into the world of photonics. And I think this morning session is going to, 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 to be devoted to that. So, so we are aware, of, to, we are aware of, of, of that. And so we, have, we don't have electrons, we have photons. So it's a, it's a slightly different world, but it's strongly inspired from what uh, all the research that has been done in uh, solid state physics. So what I'm going to talk about today is about artificial magnetism for photons and several strategies in which we can induce this, this artificial magnetism. Mm -hmm. um, the work I'm going to present you is mostly experimental and it has been done by, by the people here, so you can see. This is my, my group in, in Lille uh, and the postdoc Omar Yamadi and the PhD student Bastian Real who made most of the experimental work. And we have a very strong collaboration with the group of Jacqueline Block in, um, in Paleso uh, at Citoen, the same center as, uh, as Daniel. Uh, we had also the visit of Elena Rosas, who gave us a, a hand for, for the experiments. And then we have a very strong collaboration also with uh, Jacopo Caruso, Gracias Salerno, and Tomoki Osawa on the theory side. 
the context of uh, the work we are doing and uh, the work many people is doing in, in photonics is really inspired from the quantum hall effect. So the quantum hall effect, I don't think I need to introduce it here uh, because you are all very aware of how it, how it works. I just want to point out that what one of, one of, one of the main things that has been inspiring people in, in photonics is the fact that in, this, uh, in the quantum hall effect, you can have a description that is based on, uh, on topological properties. So you have, um, you have the Landau levels here when you put a magnetic field in the two-dimensional electron gas. And each one of these Landau levels actually has a, an associated chart number. And uh, because of that, or you can understand it because of that, you have like um, an edge state that appears at the edge of the, of the, of the whole bar, uh, which gives rise to the, to the to transport, to the quantized transport uh, in, the, in the whole bar. So this was a, well, a, a fundamental work in the, in, the, in, in, the, in the physics of solid state. And um, later, uh, Haldane made a very, very important contribution also to the, to the world of topological, uh, topologic, topology in, in, in solid state physics by uh, understanding that actually the most important part of the, for, to get this edge transport, the most important element is not to have the Landau levels, but it's actually to break the time reversal symmetry. And to show that he, Introduced this model this, that is now very celebrated, the Haldane model, in which he considered a, an hexagonal lattice, in which uh, by engineering correctly the next nearest, next nearest neighbor hoppings, uh, he could actually implement a lattice in which there is no net magnetic field. There is some magnetic field, you see. This is the, 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 the magnetic. This is the magnetic field, but there is no net magnetic field going through the through a plaquette, um, and still. Uh, without this not magnet, this the, the absence of a net magnetic field, you have gaps that opens and edge transport. So here you don't have any more Landau levels, but you have edge transport, and this edge transport is associated to topological invariance, so to the topology of the bands that uh, have been uh, engineered here. So this work was was uh, very important, as I said, and some years later, actually Haldane started to think um, if this could be uh, taken into photonics. Um, so um, there is this seminal work for topological photonics uh, from 2008, in which Haldane actually uh, discuss, discusses that to, to, to get these topological properties, you don't really need the fermionic nature of electrons or in, in a solid. But uh, this, all these topological properties and the, the appearance of, of uh, edge states and, and, and non-zero chart numbers in the bands is related to actually waves, so to, to the wave description of the, of, the, of the crystal. So then he he published this paper in which he took the, the Maxwell's equations and uh, in, a, in a structure, in a structure, in a periodic structure, and by adding some magnetism, so by breaking time reversal symmetry, he showed that you can actually uh, uh, get the um, implement this uh, model, the reference for that he says here. We have transcribed the key features of the electronic model of reference for actually reference for is the Halden model to the photonic context. So very, this was this as I said, this was very inspiring. And very quickly, the group of Marin Soliacic realized the, the, the experiment that that uh, that was proposed by Haldane. So basically, they took a square lattice of um, of uh, pillars of um, pillars, and these pillars um, are uh, operating at a microwave uh, wavelength. So for microwaves, they they are they are they are in this square lattice, and they have um, a magnetic property. So they are geotropic materials. It's a geotropic material here. Such that when you put a magnetic field, uh, waves uh, of different polarizations propagate in a different way. Okay, so time reversal symmetry is broken by the, the external magnetic field, and you get this one-way edge state. So this is the the, the band is the band of the the, the the photonic bands of this material, this two-dimensional material, um, and you see there are gaps, and, and so in one of the gaps here, this is the chart number uh, of the bands. In one of the gaps, there is a, a propagating one-way edge state, and this is a simulation in which they they see that this uh, one-way edge state goes around uh, obstacles. Okay, so this was done for for um, for microwaves because for microwaves it's relatively easy to break time reversal symmetry. You can have these zeotropic materials that can can break it. Um, there has been a lot of effort to try to bring this to other wavelengths, and uh, there is a very interesting work uh, from 2017 from the group of Bupakar Kante, in which he designed a photonic crystal in which uh, uh, he introduced also a magnetic material. Uh, such that as, under an external magnetic field, and here there's a external magnetic field, um, the, the eigen uh, energies of, of photons with uh, one polarization are different from the other polarization. And by designing a, a lattice in, a, in the proper way, a photonic lattice in the proper way, 
uh, he could actually uh, engineer uh, edge states here in, in at, the, at the edges of this lattice. Okay, and by pumping it optically, he he observed lacing. So he observed lacing on the edge states, and he and he, they could actually uh, prove that this uh, lacing is uh, this mode that is propagating here is unidirectional. It's, it's going like this, and you can see it because they put a um, a wave head here. And uh, uh, they, they see that there is way more light coming out from this edge of the wavelet than from this edge of the wavelet, which means that the coupling of the to the wavelet is mainly done by the by the mode that is uh, providing in this direction. So this was um, a very interesting work. Uh, it works at 1.5 microns, so at telecom wavelengths. And because of this uh, length scale, you see the scale of the photonic crystal is very small. So you need you need very small features, and that was the, this was the real challenge. Later has been. Um, this has been another work using polaritons from the group of uh, Sebastian Klemt, uh, in which um, uh, this is the, the this this polariton system. I'm going to describe it in a second. Um, in which they managed to implement also um, uh, transport to topological edge states um, in a honeycomb lattice by applying an external magnet. Okay. So, so these are the, the the main works in this in which these um, Chern insulators have been implemented in, in photonics. So still. The, the 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 question of breaking time reversal symmetry in photonics is a very open one. It's a, a challenge because it's it's uh, photons are still very very not very sensitive to magnetic fields, and and is going to be one of the I mean the the, the, the narrative of my of my, my presentation. So um, I just want to mention that there are many other topological effects in photonics, not impl not in, implying breaking of time reversal symmetry. And I'm not going to treat them, but if you want to take a look at them, there is this nice uh, review in which uh, many, many uh, effects are discussed. Okay, so um, so this is going to be the plan of my presentation. So I'm going to introduce microcavity polaritons in which uh, I will show you we can break down reversal symmetry. Um, I will, I'm going to show you how we can uh, uh, create Landau levels without magnetic fields. So here we will not break down reversal symmetry, but we will implement. Uh, effective Landau levels. And at the end, if I have time, I hope so, I will show you how we can break down reversal symmetry, but not with an external magnetic field, by using photon-photon uh, interactions. OK. So uh, let me present this, the, the, the system we use, which is a, uh, an amazing system in which we can, we can, we can study many, many different uh, physical, system, physical uh, phenomena. So this is a microcavity. It's a semiconductor microcavity made of aluminum gallium arsenide. Um, so it consists of two black mirrors. You see this is a black mirror made of alternating layers of uh, algas material of different com different content of aluminum and gallium. And gallium. Okay, so this is, this is a black mirror, this is a black mirror, this is a spacer. And in the spacer, uh, you can trap a photon. So the, the, photo, the photon can be trapped here. Okay, and it can, can stay there for quite a while. For instance, it can stay there such that it makes 100,000 uh, ghost um, rebounds in the, in the mirrors. Okay, so it can stay for a while. Um, so this photon is trapped here, and what we do is that we int introduce a, a quantum well in the in the, in the spacer, a gallium marginal quantum well or an indium gallium marginal quantum well, in which the fundamental excitation is an exit. So it's an electron hole pair, okay? So that appears when you promote an electron from the valence band to the conduction band. So you leave a hole behind, uh, and this electron and this hole they bound together and they form this exciton. Okay? And this exciton. We design the quantum well such that the, the, the energy of this exciton, the, the, the optical energy of this exciton to excite it, is exactly the energy of the trapped photons in the cavity. And in this way, the, the photons stay in the cavity, get absorbed by the exciton, they are emitted and stay in the cavity, they get absorbed by the, by the quantum well and from an exciton, and so on and so forth. And they form um, a new quasi particle that we call polariton that is partly excitonic and partly photonic. And this is the beauty of these polaritons, that it has this double nature. So the excitonic and photonic. So for instance, by manipulating the photonic part, we can implement lattices here. And I'm going to show you how. We can also get access to the polariton field because it, the photons escape out of the cavity. Polaritons escape out of the cavity in the form of photons, and we can look at them. And the excitonic part uh, gives rise to many beautiful properties. Like for instance, it acts as an active element. So it can give rise to lacing. It gives rise to, to interactions, chi three interactions, so particle-particle interactions. And it also introduces some sensitivity to external magnetic fields uh, because excitons have a spin, a real spin. And when you put it in the magnetic field, there is a Siemens splitting that appears. So this Siemens splitting will be inherited uh, to, uh, into the polarity. 
Okay, so this is the planar cavity that comes from our MBE machine, the molecular epitaxial machine. It's two dimensional, it's a two dimensional cavity. And now what we can do is we can etch it. We can just uh, design a mask, chemically attack it. Uh, and then we can get, for instance, these micro pillars. So this, in these micro pillars, photons are confined in the three directions of space. So in the vertical direction by the mirrors, as I explained, and in the horizontal direction by the index of refraction contrast between this semiconductor and the, the vacuum here. So in that, in that way, we have like some kind of like a photonic uh, atom in which the photonic eigenstates are uh, uh, quantized. So we have the lowest energy mode, which is an S mode. It has a cylindrical symmetry. We have the first excited mode, which is a P mode. Then we have D modes, et cetera, and so on. So this is for one micropillar, but we can uh, couple two of them. So here there are two couple micropillars. So we designed the mask uh, that we that later we etched such way that the micropillars overlap. And now photons can jump from one pillar to the other um, without um, um, just by, by tunneling from one pillar to the other. So in that case, the, the eigenstates, so if we look at the S modes, so the lowest energy modes, the eigenstates of this coupled system are not anymore the left and right photons, uh, photon states, but they are like bonding and anti-bonding modes uh, that, that, uh, that appear from this, from this coupling. And this uh, energy difference between the bonding and anti-bonding mode is exactly the, the coupling strength that we can control by setting this distance. So of course now we can go into more elaborate structures. And one of the one of, of the structures we have studied in, a, in, a, in quite some detail is this hexagonal lattice. So this is a honeycomb lattice of micropillar. You see, this is a micropillar here. Here you have the upper mirror, lower mirror, the cavity is somewhere in the middle, and then polaritons or photons can jump from one pillar to the next. Okay, and then you can see here an hexagon, for instance, another hexagon, etc. So it, it looks very much like a like a like like the conical lattice that uh, you have in mind when you think of graphene, <clears throat> and uh, um, and give rise to very similar uh, dispersions for but this time for photons. So for instance, if you look at the S modes of each micropillar, so this S mode here, they couple together and they give rise to these two lowest bands that you see here. Okay, so do you see there's a Dirac cone here for the photons, but you can also look at the higher modes, for instance the P modes here. We have this P X and P Y geometry. And they give rise to this set of bands that you can see here, in which there is a flat band here, and here there is a there is another Dirac cone, and here there is some band that has is a bit uh, distorted by the coupling to the upper modes. Okay, so how would, do we do these images? It's very simple. We shine a, a, a non-resonant laser here, so we create electrons and holes that form polaritons. These polaritons relax in the bands, and as they relax, they uh, they escape out of the cavity in the form of photons, and by looking at the energy of the emission. And at the angle of emission, we can extract the momentum of, of the, the in-plane momentum of the photon in the cavity and also its energy. So we just measure with a, with a spectrometer and, a, and some uh, lens system to, to, to measure the angles. So it's very, it, it reminds a bit of ARPES, actually, but with, uh, with photons. Um, so let me now go into the, um, the first experimental results in which we, uh, we, we implement a photonic Landau levels using this, uh, this system. So here we are not going to break down reversal symmetry. We are going to go around that, but we are going to be able to implement uh, photonic Landau levels uh, without breaking down reversal symmetry. And to do that, we used a trick that was introduced by by, by Francisco Guinea, Katzenelson, and, and, and Andre Game, in which uh, they consider um, a, a honeycomb lattice under strain, so under spatial strain, with a gradient of hoppings in, in three in three directions. So this idea. Um, when you do that, you can get, introduce a gauge field that actually uh, results in an effective magnetic field in the in the at the Dirac cones and give rise to these uh, Landau levels. So this was already introduced uh, experimentally in photonics in, in this work by Rexman and, co and collaborators, in which they did that in a couple of webguides, and they observed evidence of the appearance of these um, these Landau levels by seeing that light was localized at the edges. Um, so what I'm going to do to show you is that we can actually access the dispersion, we can actually actually access the wave functions, and even we can show the, the appearance of edge modes that transport light uh, between the lambda levels. So how do we do that? So we take we start from our honeycomb lattice that is here. We have the hoppings here, the, the nearest nearest hoppings nearest neighbor hoppings that you, you see here, T1, T2, T3, and what you can do is that you can just take this, write the Hamiltonian. So this is the Hamiltonian. Um, in the basis of the AB sub lattice. Um, and if you expand this Hamiltonian um, around the Dirac cones, you can write it like, you can write these terms like that. This is only around the Dirac cones, okay? So you have the linear dispersion, kx, ky, and you have this extra term that appears here. Okay, this extra term is like, it's a like cage potential. 
it has this form it has this form here so you see that if all the hoppings are the same d1 d2 and d3 are the same these uh, gauge potentials are actually zero but um and this is what happens in regular graphene but if now you 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 you, you make t1 t23 different and more importantly you make one of them for instance t1 to depend in the space so to have a gradient this gauge potential is non-zero and additionally give rise to an effective magnetic field and this is the magnetic field that you get so this is what we do with what we are going to consider so this magnetic field is set is set by the gradient of the hopping and by also this uh, index here which is the valley index and which it has different signs in different valleys in in the honeycomb in the in the in the, in the honeycomb dispersion so it will be positive at k and negative at k prime so overall the magnetic field is zero of course because we are not breaking the universal symmetry but at, at each cone around each cone it will not be zero so this is the sample we fabricated so you see here the these hoppings are all the same all over the, all over the sample but this one here is very it's very small because the, the separation between pillars is large and here the hopping is, is strong because the separation between the pillars is short small okay and when you do the calculation uh, um, the type binding calculation of this you get this kind of spectrum these are the two direct cones you have then n equals zero lambda level here and then you have other lambda levels that appear at uh, at higher uh, energies okay and and the same on the other on the other direct cone corresponding to these two magnetic fields that have opposite sign okay so um, let's see what let's see what comes out from the experiment when we, when we do that so this is a, this is the dispersion uh, when there is no strain so the regular honeycomb lattice you see the direct cones here and now this is what happens when we put a high strain so the dispersion gets strongly modified and it's not very easy to see here the lambda levels uh, but still if you look at in real space there are hints that uh, that uh, there is an effective magnetic field in engineer here and i'm going to show you that so this is the real space emission uh, of the unstrained honeycomb lattice when we excite uh, with a localized uh, pump so here we excite uh, um, photons polaritons uh, in this in this region and then they propagate away okay and then they decay because they escape out of the cavity but you see you can you can clearly identify the the hexagonal geometry uh, when you select this energy here of the Dirac cones now if you come if you come here to the the sample with strain at the energy of the Dirac cones what you see is that the the, the, the real space emission is very different so you see that there is a lot of light coming from the B sub lattice, but very very small light coming from the A sub lattice. And this is exactly what you expect when you have uh, an, uh, an, uh, this uh, artificial uh, magnetic field and you look at the zero uh, Landau level. So at zero Landau level, in this uh, geometry in which you, you engineer the, the magnetic field by strain, you should have emission only from one sub lattice, the B sub lattice. And of course, if you change, the, you reverse the, um, the gradient of the strain, the, the emission will be different from zero on the other sublattice. So this is the, the, which sublattice is set by the gradient of the strain. Okay, anyway, here we cannot see very well the lambda level. So what we did is, that, is to go into the P-bands. So I, I mentioned that there are these P-bands. We have this, la, this flat, flat band, there's also a flat band here, and then there are these direct cones here. And the advantage of these P-bands is that the, the band width is much bigger because the, the hopping strength is, is stronger. So then it's, it's easier to see uh, the, the, this, uh, these lambda levels. So this is the real space Im Im image uh, at this energy of the, of the Dirac cone. And now if we introduce the strain, what you see is that the dispersion changes significantly. And if you look into this area here, I'm zooming here, here you can, we can identify by comparing with the simulations, this, uh, this band that uh, splits in two, okay? And this, this band actually corresponds to the n equals zero lambda level. It splits in two because our lattice is very small. And uh, then there are some final size, size effects, uh, but still we can identify these uh, lambda levels here. And then we can even identify the n equal minus one lambda level that appears uh, at, 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 at smaller energy. If we, if we look into real space and we select any of these two energies, uh, we see that again, we have this sublattice uh, um, um, demerization. So light is coming from the, from the B sublattice here. And uh, from the, here is B sublattice, B sublattice, B sublattice. And there is very, light, very small light coming from the A sublattice. You can see that now the, the emission has this kind of like donut shape, and it is because we are using the P-modes, which have this uh, donut shape. Okay. What is more interesting is what happens here. If you look uh, at this, uh, this dispersion, there are also modes that appear here. And these modes are actually propagating modes uh, that uh, appear uh, in between the lambda levels, and they are located on the, at the edges. So the color here is the, in this simulation, is the, the, the localization of the, 
of the wave functions, and you see that this blue are located on the on the right side. Okay, are located on the right side. But this interesting here is that in both Dirac cones, uh, the propagating modes are located on the right edge. Okay, so in artificial gauge field that we are implementing, the these propagating modes, which would be equivalent of the of the one-way edge modes uh, in in the quantum Hall effect, are both local, located in the same edge. This is very different to what happens when you have a real magnetic field. In a real magnetic field, you have the same magnetic field in both um, in, in both cones, and you will have an edge, an edge mode on the right going in that direction, and an edge mode on the left going on the opposite direction. So you will have really a chiral transport. Here, we are not breaking the reversal symmetry, and, uh, and the, 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 this, the, the modes appear on the same side and with opposite direction. So you see, if, I, if photons propagate in this direction, there's nothing that protects them from Scatter back to the other to the other channel that goes up in the, on the same edge. Still, we can try to see these uh, these modes, and this actually this is what we do here. So we take our sample, we excite on the left edge, and on the left edge we see some decay. Okay, this this is um, this is this is decay because we are also populating a bit of the of the bulk modes. And if you look at the dispersion when we excite this on this side, so we will mainly see light coming from from this side. You see that we have this uh, these are trivial edge modes. Then we have a gap, and this is the n equal minus one, uh, the n equal minus one um, the Landau level. And if you look at the at the other edge here, you see that light propagates much more efficiently uh, towards the top and the bottom. And if you look at the dispersion, this is k, this is energy. Now between this uh, this uh, band here and the n equal minus one edge, one mi n equal mi minus one Landau level, we see a band, and this band is the band of this edge. Mode. Of course, there is a band with the opposite group velocity on the other Dirac point, and this corresponds to the two. Um, group velocities here. Okay. So we can we can use this um, photonic system very nicely to um, um, implement Landau levels, to observe the wave functions, and 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 even to to um, um, to study the dynamics uh, on the on the edge states with a very nice resolution. Because this is this is this this sizes is micrometers, so we can use optical tools to to to, to look at that. So there are very interesting perspectives. Uh, once we have this, we can look at uh, at lacing uh, in these modes, and this is a very uh, fun, uh, genuinely genuinely photonic uh, uh, property. So we can look at lacing. So if we if we look at lacing in the in the in the honeycomb lattice that is not strained, so in the regular one, we have already reported it. It uh, lacing appears at the top of this band here, and this you have this very beautiful uh, lacing mode that appears, but. Um, what we have not done yet, but there are simulations and, and, and uh, there's a theory work by, 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 by the group of Simanska and Carlos Soto in which they show that using the, the lattice we, we, we have designed, you can, when you, when you pump strongly the, the, the system, there is a spontaneous symmetry breaking that makes your system lace only on one direct point, not on, not, not on both, but only on one. And, uh, and this uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking uh, and this lacing uh, appears in the form of vortices, okay? Vortices that that um, turn all in the same direction. Okay, it could be one uh, one uh, one cardinality or the other, and this is spontaneous. It's spontaneous symmetry breaking. So in this uh, the system, the, the, there's a possibility of studying this uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking in which uh, particles um, in the Landau levels condense, they form a, a lacing state, and they can actually have uh, show some cardinality that is uh, that is depends on the on the noise actually. Then each realization will be different. <laughs> okay, so I still have uh, maybe uh, ten minutes or something like this. Five minutes. Um, so you have, you have five more minutes. Okay, perfect. So I think it's enough to to discuss this second um, this second work. So now what we are going to do, I show you I show you a strategy not to break down reversal symmetry to observe Landau levels. What I'm going to show you is that we can break down reversal symmetry in a very original way. So by by using uh, polariton polariton interactions. So this is the this is these equations. You should not be afraid of it. It's uh, it's very simple. It's the it's the it's the Schrödinger equation, which comes from the Maxwell's equations, uh, that uh, describes the the um, the, the um, dynamics of polaritons in uh, in our in our system. Uh, so you can see here there is a, like a, a derivative of, of some wave function um, in time. So it's really like a like a Maxwell equation equal to the the on-site energy. Uh, plus, the, I, I'm sorry, I'm going to consider now only a single pillar. Eh? So there will be only one mode. Only one mode, this mode, this S mode here that I discussed in the beginning. So we have this onsite energy. Then I, I told you that we can actually in, in, uh, introduce um, a Siemens splitting 
uh, thanks to the to the thema splitting of the excitons of the excitonic part of the polariton. So there is a thema splitting here. These are polariton polariton interactions. Okay, uh, so there's a square missing here. Sorry, this is a, this is a, this is a square missing. Um, we, we also have interactions between the polaritons and the excitonic reservoir because there is an, uh, a reservoir of excitons here that is going to play a very important role. And then we have the gain because we are pumping the system with a laser. Uh, so we have a um, relaxation of polaritons to this mode and also the losses. Okay, so this is the, this equation. And this is for polaritons with sigma plus polarization. We have two polarizations, sigma plus and sigma minus. And then we have the same for sigma minus. There is another equation that describes the system, which is the equation of this reservoir here. So we are pumping polaritons uh, with our, our external laser out of resonance. We create this reservoir, and the reservoir has some lifetime, and it also couples by via this mode, this 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 uh, this term here, into the polariton system. So polaritons excitons relax and couple to the to the polaritons. Okay, very nice. So if we forget about these terms, interactions and uh, uh, interactions between polaritons and interaction with the reservoir, we can we have this external external magnetic field effect that we could exploit. And this has been done in several works. So this is an example. We put the, the system in, in an external magnetic field and we get a sigma splitting, you see? This is the, the, the splitting with the sigma plus and the sigma minus um, um, lines at high magnetic fields for Tesla. And you can see the splitting here, the sigma splitting. So the sigma splitting that appears in the excitons is inherited in the polarities. It's a very nice thing. What I'm going to do now is to use not this external magnetic field, but to use interactions to introduce this magnetic field. So. You can see here in this term that this, I mean, this term plays exactly the same role as this one. It's just that instead of having a magnetic field now, what I need to, in, to implement is a, an, um, an imbalance between a reservoir of spin up excitons and spin down excitons. And the interaction with the, with the polariton here, which is strongly uh, um, spin dependent, will introduce this, um, this uh, splitting that is equivalent to the splitting uh, induced by the Siemens split. So, <clears throat> So how do we do that? So we just take a, a, a laser with a, a given polarization, sigma minus, we pump the system, uh, and we will we create an imbalance, uh, an imbalance between the, uh, a reservoir excitons with the minus spin and the plus spin. Okay. And uh, this is the this is the experiment. We look at the S modes, and when we look at the S mode and we increase the, the power, you see that the, the emission energy between the, the sigma plus and sigma minus, uh, sorry, this is not written here, but yes, sigma plus and sigma minus. Um, there's a splitting that appears, okay? And this splitting is uh, really coming from this term and it reminds strongly the, the Asiman splitting. You can see it here. This is the, the eigen energies of uh, the energies of the, of the two modes and you see that there's a splitting that appears. So we are basically breaking the reversal symmetry by pumping the system with uh, uh, spin up or spin down uh, um, um, excitons and the, thanks to the interaction with the polaritons, we, we break the reversal symmetry. Of course, if we put linear polarization, Linear polarization means we put as many uh, n minus uh, excitons as s plus x, n plus excitons. We have a global blue shift, so global blue shift, global interactions that, that, that blue shift, but they are the same for both sigma mass and sigma plus and sigma minus. Okay. So now, okay, one last minute. Um, let me show you what we can do with the p modes, which we, we, because it's way more interesting. So with p modes, what we have is that. This uh, we should have now that we introduce the polarization. We have we should have the px, the py mode, okay, that we can relabel or re, uh, rearrange into l equal plus one vortex, l equal min minus one vortex. So this is a change of basis simply, plus the polarization, sigma plus and sigma minus. So we should have four modes, plus one, minus one, sigma plus and sigma minus. We, we should have four modes. But actually, what happens is that in this the electric structures there is a very strong spin orbit coupling that uh, couples. L plus one modes and L minus one modes to the sigma plus and sigma minus in a specific way. And this specific way appears here. So this is the now the this uh, this this these P modes. We have now four of uh, three levels, okay, uh, with very specific polarizations that come from this spin orbit coupling. That is something very well known in uh, in, in optics when you have a, a dielectric in a confined in a confined region. So the lowest energy mode, you see here the splitting that we measure, the, the three modes, the lowest energy mode. As a radial polarization, so it's a combination of sigma plus and sigma minus, minus one and plus one vortices, such that it gives rise to radial polarization. Asymptotic polarization here for the upper mode. Okay, so this is this is the other way around. Sorry, and in the middle, you have two modes: one with an L equal plus one uh, vortex for sigma plus, 
and L equal minus one vertex for sigma minus. So what we are going to do now is to use these interactions to break down reversal symmetry, induce a, a splitting here. Okay, so you see, we put a sigma minor laser, we create this uh, reservoir, we induce a splitting here. And um, when, what we see is that this, uh, these three modes that appear at, at low power, low pump power, the, the, the middle one splits in two. And this, 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 um, these two modes have very well defined um, 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 a vorticity. So this one, this minus this uh, this sigma minus one has a vorticity L equal minus one. So it has a vortex. So light is coming with a vortex. And the other one has a vorticity on the other direction. Light is coming with a vortex, a special vortex on the other direction. And we can just by selecting the energy of emission, we can we can uh, de detect light that has one chir chirality or the other chirality. So we have split these two modes with different chirality thanks to this artificial magnetic field that we have implemented thanks to the interactions. Okay, so I went a bit fast through this last part, but um, maybe we can discuss it during the coffee break. So I, just to summarize uh, very quickly, so we have, I showed you these Landau levels that we can, we can do without breaking time reversal symmetry, just by playing with the strain. And then in the second part, I showed you that we can, uh, we can introduce an artificial magnetic field by, uh, by using the interactions. Okay. And uh, then we have some chiral emission, a chiral emission that, uh, that we, can, uh, we can detect just by selecting the energy of the emission. Of course, the interesting thing is now to, to use this, uh, the fact that we can break the reversal symmetry in this way to create a churn insulator in a lattice. And this is uh, something that in principle can be done. So we replace the external magnetic field by the interactions. So we can implement a churn insulator by interactions uh, in a honeycomb lattice. And also the other big advantage of this method that I show you is that we can have a stagger potentials, stagger magnetic field potential, um, just by playing with the, the way we pump uh, a lattice. And okay, again, this could be very interesting to implement exotic uh, uh, phases in, uh, in, in, in these polariton lattices. Okay, so sorry I went a bit out of time. So, but I thank you for your for your attention, and I'm open for any question. Thank you, Alberto, for this exciting presentation. Uh, it's always great to <laughs> to see the the news in the domain. So the panel is open for questions. You can type your questions in the questions and answer box at the bottom of the screen, or you can just raise your hand, and we will let you directly speak to Alberto. I just want to remind you that we have we will have a coffee break where you can directly interact with Alberto and David uh, just after this session. So, is there any questions? So maybe uh, maybe I can start, Alberto. What is the order uh, the the influence of the disorder in the superlattices in the first example that you show? Yeah, so it's uh, it's, it's important actually. So. Um, <clears throat> So in, in this honeycomb lattices that I that I show, we we have disorders that are on the order of the of the wave of the line width. Uh, so in principle, it should not play a a, a, a critical role. But uh, uh, we we see uh, we see the effect, uh, for instance, on the on the wave functions that I that I that I showed um, mm -hmm. just here. So uh, this order actually makes the the the, the, the this intensity is not regular. So you had, we have some irregularity here that we could actually, we can actually uh, quantify uh, that uh, witness this disorder. Still, you can see the dispersions are quite. Uh, I mean, we can still identify the Landau level, so it, the disorder is not enough, enough to 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 destroy the effect. Okay. But there is disorder present that is related to the etching. How, yes, how we... but uh, what is the role of uh, different sizes or different positions? I guess that positions are quite regular. So you, you can see it in the Curie transform, but you have variations in the sizes. Yes, so uh, that's that's for instance, all for, the, the robustness properties or not? Yes, yes, it's important. So ro, ro, uh, variations in the sizes give rise to on-site energy differences, and variations on the couplings here and how this, this mm -hmm. coupling is done give rise to variations in the in the hoppings. So in some uh, cases, one or the other can have very important roles. Um, here. Um, both have more or less the same role, so they, it does, it does, it's, uh, they, they, they just localize uh, light in, in, in some areas and less in a bit other areas, and then you move around and it's the other way around. But in some other models, like for instance the SSH lattice, which uh, we have also this, uh, worked on, uh, for instance the one that is very important is the one on the on site because it's the one that breaks chiral symmetry. So this is something that needs to be taken into account in this. Uh, but still. Uh, 
Yeah, no, maybe I continue during the coffee break because I have so many questions about it. Uh, we do have a question in the questions and answers box. Maybe you can read it and try to answer it. So how does this effective magnetic field arise? What are the physical processes involved? Only hop ingredient? May you please elaborate? So yes, uh, it's the hop ingredient. So uh, as, I, as, as I mentioned, this is an idea that came from, 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 from graphene. So from, from, from this work here, in which uh, basically uh, you can just work out the, the, the tie binding equations, tie binding model equations. And when you do that, you, you see here that uh, you, you, you can describe your system as if it was a, 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 honey, a regular honeycomb lattice. So this is how you have to see it. So the honeycomb lattice with strain is equivalent. You can describe it as a regular lattice, so without strain with a, an, an artificial magnetic field, with a gauge field, okay? And, um, and the important thing here is that you don't break the reversal symmetry, so that this artificial magnetic field has opposite signs uh, for uh, opposite uh, Dirac cones. Um, okay. So for opposite Dirac cones. So this is the important thing. And, and the main, one of the main effects is, for instance, that you have localization on one sublattice only at the n equals zero lambda level. Uh, and if I have just one 30 seconds more, uh, if you have a real magnetic field, so it's the same on both Dirac cones. So in what Dirac cone, n equals zero lambda level will be localized on the A sub lattice. On the other Dirac cone with the same magnetic field, the, the uh, n equals zero lambda level will be localized on the B sub lattice. So overall, you will have n equals zero lambda levels on both A and B. But here, because on, one, on the other Dirac cone, it's opposite uh, magnetic field. So here you are localized on A sub lattice, and here you are localized also on A sub lattice because the magnetic field is opposite. Okay, so one this is one of the main consequences of the fact that you are not breaking the reversal symmetry in reality. You are just playing with the gradient. Is that that you have localization only on one sub lattice? This, this you would not have in a real graphene under an, a real magnetic field. Okay, thank you, Alberto. I remind all the participants that we will have the coffee break where you can discuss. Face-to-face uh, -face with Alberto directly in a regular Zoom meeting, so there, there will be no need to type the questions. You can just directly ask and make some comments and directly discuss with him and David. Alberto, thank you very much again for this amazing presentation. We will move forward now for the next uh, presentation.